us start. For evidently there are two possibilities. So I am discussing the yoga of the intelligent will, because he has told him uh, the karma yoga is karma is superior to uh, jnana, and at the same time he has told him that jnana yoga is uh, very special. So he is discussing that. So this is the karma, uh, the jnana yoga, yoga of the intelligent will. So let's start reading. We have to read for evidently. Uh, <coughs> Sunki, you have not read for a long time. You'll read. Maybe she is not there on the line now. Ah, she is there. Yes, I will read. Okay, read for evidently. Ah, uh, let me find my uh, earphone. Wait a second. Okay, I used to read. For evidently, there are two possibilities of the action and the intelligent will. It may take its downward and outward orientation towards a discursive action of the perceptions and the will in the triple play of Prakriti, or it may take its upward and inward orientation towards a settled, a settled peace and equality in the calm and immutable purity of the conscious silent soul no longer subject to the distraction of nature. In the former alternative, the subjective being is at the mercy of the object of sense. It lives in the outward contact of things. That life is the life of desire. For the senses excited by their objects create a, less, a restless or often violent disturbance, a strong or even headlong outward movement towards the seizure of these objects and their enjoyment. And they carry away the sense mind as the winds carry away a ship upon the sea. The mind subjected to the emotions, passions, longings, impulsions, awakened by this outward movement of the senses, carries away similarly the intelligent will, which loses, therefore, is the power of calm discrimination and mastery. Subjection of the soul to the confused play of the three gunas of Prakriti, in their eternal entangled twining and wrestling, ignorance, a false, sensuous, objective life of the soul, enslavement to grief and wrath, and attachment and passion, are the results of the downward trend of the buddhi, the troubled life of the ordinary, unenlightened, undis undisciplined man. Those who like the Vedabhadins, those who like the Vedabhadins, make, sen make sense enjoyment the object of action, and its fulfillment the highest aim of the soul, are misleading guidance. The inner, the inner subjective self-delight, independent of object, is our true aim, and the high and wide poise of our peace and liberation. <clears throat> okay, so we'll go center by center and see what is it. But evidently, there are two possibilities of the action of the intelligent will. Now, the intelligent will is the pure mind, not the vital, not the physical mind, which is the senses which is the interpreter of senses, not the vital mind, which is also that of the desire, but the pure mind. So with the pure mind, you concentrate, and it has got two actions. One is upward and one is downwards. That's what he's discussing. It may take its downward and outward orientation towards a discursive action of the perceptions and the will in the triple play of prakriti, or it may take its upward and inward orientation towards a settled peace and equality in the calm and immutable purity of the conscious, silent soul, no longer subject to the distractions of nature. So let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines, one sentence. Oh, sorry, no, <laughs> six lines <laughs> or five lines even. Okay. So this intelligent will can go either outwards into the physical world or it can go inwards into the physical world. And what are the results of that? He is telling you. If it goes outwards, we are subjected to the <clears throat> triple play of prakriti. What is the triple play of prakriti? Sattva, rajas, tamas. <clears throat> okay. So that is to say, your body, your mind, life and body are the most real to you. You are identified with them. And you are in an egoistic consciousness and you are seeing the physical world and 
you are interested in them. You are captured by the outer physical forms. So I'm reading the. It may take its downward and outward. Okay, so downward and outward. Orient. Outward means the senses are all going outwards. Not single senses going inwards. All are going outwards. They are directed outwards. Orientation. Outward orientation towards a discursive action. The word discursive is very interesting. It means going outwards and distributing its intensity. It's not intense anymore. It becomes diluted. The concentration becomes diluted. Or this is one. Or it may take its upward and inward orientation. If you go upwards, you go to the self. If you go inwards, you go to the psychic being. And in both, you get profit. And what is that profit? Towards a settled peace. It's not only peace, but it's a settled peace. It becomes permanent, <clears throat> relatively. Not always, but relatively. And equality in the calm and immutable purity of the conscious, silent soul. Conscious, silent soul is obviously, if it is silent, it is obviously the self. Okay, because the psychic being. Is also silent, but not silence in the sense of the psychic being. Uh, sorry, the self. The self is absolute silence. But if this uh, <coughs> the psychic being comes forward, there is a silence of samata. Okay, so <coughs> it is samata is there also at the top. But this is uh, you are often subjected to the emotions, and they change their values in this psychic emergence. But in the self, you are absolutely not affected by the emotions at all. So, or, so settled peace and equality. Equality, you are not affected by anything. You are absolutely calm and quiet. Yeah, last time we saw that beautiful image in the Gita that the all the waters are going into the sea, but the sea remains unchanged because it is infinite. One small river going, however large that river, it may be the Amazon Delta or it may be the uh, Ganges or the Nile. These are the biggest rivers in the in the world. It makes no difference to the sea because the sea is great. It absorbs all these things. So a yogi who is absolutely silent, all the emotions, all the thoughts, and all these things may come into him, but he is absolutely undisturbed. It's a beautiful image of the Gita. And that's exactly what he's saying. Silent soul, no longer subject to the distractions of nature. What are the distractions of nature? The sights, the sounds, the tastes, and the smells, and the touches from outside. These are all the distractions of nature. Because as soon as there is a touch, our consciousness goes out to see what that touch is. When there is a smell, our consciousness goes out to see where that smell is coming from. <laughs> when there is a sound, we get attracted to the sound. Where is it coming from? Sights also are the one that draws us outwards. So that's what he's saying. But if you are in that conscious, silent soul, then all these things are coming into you. It's not that they don't come into you, but you are absolutely undisturbed. In the former alternative, former means the <clears throat> when you are going outwards and you are subjected to. The forces of nature, sattva, rajas, tamas, identified with body, mind, life. In the former alternative, the subjective being is at the mercy of the objects of sense. Okay. You are subjected to the objects of sense. What is the object of sense? The things that you see in the physical world are the objects. The smells that you smell in the physical world are the objects of sense. The sounds that you hear, sounds also can attract you very much, na? Beautiful music will attract you. Beautiful, rather loud and noisy music will uh, make you repulsed. Okay, so these are all the you are subject to the objects of sense. <laughs> Interesting language. You are subject to the objects of sense. <laughs> so <clears throat> it lives in the outward contact of things. The outward context, all the senses that are coming in, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches. That life is a life of desire. So when you are when you are subject to the body mind life, there are two three things that happen. One is you are in an egoistic consciousness. Then you have desires and attachments and ego. 
So these three things happen when you are identified with your body mind life and you are thinking that the physical world is the most important and all your senses are directing you outwards. But there is another, that is you can go inwards. For the senses excited by their objects create a restless and often violent disturbance. Not always, but violent disturbance. If you see something beautiful, you want to possess it. You see some very strong smell and you get a desire for good food. <laughs> All the body is saying. A strong or even headlong outward movement towards the seizure of these objects and their enjoyment. And they carry away the sense mind as the winds carry away a ship on the sea. This is the quotation from the <clears throat> Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 67. <laughs> Indriyanam hi charatam yan, yan mano anuvidhiyate tadasya, praj, tadasya harati prajyam vayu nava eva ambasi. Like a vayu, like the wind, propels a boat on the sea, in the, in the waters, ambasi waters. So this is the image. So it gets blown away. You can't control yourself. Your mind gets absolutely blown away. I remember a very interesting uh, uh, interesting just now how far it can get blown away. Okay. <laughs> I've seen uh, two, three. One I was told when I was some of our boys, you know, uh, Shadin, Devranjan and his brother, they used to go out to, uh, <clears throat> to Jinji. And one day when they were sitting in Jinji and having their dinner, okay, there was somebody who came and he saw the food they were eating and he was exactly what the Gita is saying here. Okay? He just pounced on that food in the midst of them all and took away the food. <laughs> so, so That is so graphic a thing. Of course, he was hungry. But sometimes even if you are not hungry, you will feel hungry if the smells of food are very good. <laughs> and the smells also. So, this is what happens. Recently, a video also has come. Okay? Where a man, a homeless man, is running in a train, and as soon as the train is nearing the station and is slowing down, this man grabs the food from some of the passengers and runs out. <laughs> so, the good image of what happens to us, and we just absolutely want to satisfy our desire, and we go to any extent to satisfy our desire. Just like a, a boat is on a stormy water, it is blown away. So, our mind control is just not enough for that. That's what he said. As the winds carry away a ship upon the sea. Prajyam harati. Prajyam, your steady, intelligent will. Prajyam. It harati. Just like now, uh, now the boat on the waters. Vayu takes away the <coughs> boat on the waters. Blows it away. So... The mind subjected to the emotions, passions, longings, impulsions, awakened by this outward movement of the senses, carries away similarly the intelligent will, which loses therefore its power of calm, discrimination and mastery. If you go inwards, it's the opposite. You, you can become master, not immediately, but after a good deal of effort, you can become master of these things and you can remain unaffected. <clears throat> Subjection of the soul to the conscious play of the three gunas of prakriti in their eternal entangled twining and wrestling, ignorance, a false sensuous objective life of the soul, enslavement to grief and wrath and attachment and passion are the results of the downward trend of the buddhi. So, when you are identified with your body mind life, these things are bound to happen. You will get completely entangled in the twining and wrestling. Note that you have to really struggle sometimes with your desires. Ignorance, completely not at all clear thinking, ignorance, false, sensuous. The senses are dominating in you. Objective life of the soul. Objective life, the physical life. Going outwards is objective. Going inwards is objective. Objective life of the soul. Enslavement to grief and wrath. By the way, that word wrath can be pronounced as 
wrath and sometimes they also pronounce it as wrath okay yes uh, sunki is pronounced as wrath that also is okay and attachment and passion are the results of the downward trend of the guru so if you let your senses rule you you are ignorant and you are not seeing the reality and you get blown away you have no control over yourself you let your body mind life control you your desires and your ego absolutely dominate and you are in the grip of ignorance that's what is said those like the ordinary no wait where is it gone yeah uh, are the results of the downward trend of the buddhi there is a comma tag there again that shows we are putting the troubled life of the ordinary unenlightened undisciplined man an undisciplined man obeys his senses the disciplined man controls his senses <clears throat> i think there is an image i don't remember if it is the gita now uh, tarika should be able to tell me whether the the uh, the soul is compared to a, the chariot is the body and you are sitting inside and the reins of the horses are the the control and the horses are the senses and they are running wild and you have to control the um the horses with the reins and the reins are your mind okay so you don't let them go you have to control if you are controlled then you are a, a disciplined man but you, if you don't let the you allow the horses to go run wild then you are the undisciplined man those who like the vedantins this is you have to be very careful it is not those who like the vedantin that means who love the vedantin it's not that. you have to put a comma those who comma like the vedantin comma make sense enjoyment the object of action and its fulfillment the high aim of the soul are misleading guides you remember the vedavadins are those who recite mantras and all that but only for benefits in the physical world okay? that's why the gita has already criticized the vedavadins they are using the mantras they are using the vedas but they are only stuck in the outward sense <coughs> okay they want wealth in the country they want success in the, uh, in the in the world they want children in the world this is the vedavadins who make sense i mean the object of action and its fulfillment the highest aim of the soul are misleading guides this is again refers to uh, chapter 2 verse 42 and 43 the inner subjective self delight independent of objects is our true aim and a high and wide poise of our peace and liberation so you have to go inwards and not outwards you have to control your senses and when you go inwards then there is a self delight not the delight of the sense objects not of food or sound or clothes or whatever but your inner condition the when you realize the psychic being the psychic being is the one that gives you ananda without any cause and that is pure ananda that's what he say this inner subjective self delight delight not depending on other things but itself independent of objects is our true aim and high and wide poise of our peace and liberation so <clears throat> he has discussed the outward now we will discuss the inward in a small paragraph so we read that <clears throat> sarika you are the one who has read the gita <laughs> i don't think she's there ah no not yet <laughs> so maybe archana ji you can read yes yes sir yeah you can do therefore <clears throat> therefore it is upward ah okay i am I'm, i'm clear na therefore yeah. it is the upward and inward orientation of the intelligent will that we must resolutely choose with a settled concentration and perseverance yeah vasya we must yes. fix it firmly in the calm self knowledge of the purusha the first movement must be obviously to get rid of desire 
which is the whole root of the evil and suffering. And in order to get rid of desire, we must put an end to the cause of desire, the rushing out of the senses to seize and enjoy their objects. We must draw them back when they are inclined thus to rush out, draw them away from their objects, as the tortoise draws, draws in his limbs into the shell, so these, in, uh, so these into their source, quiescent in the mind, the mind quiescent in intelligence, the intelligence quiescent in the soul and its self-knowledge, observing the action of nature, but not subject to it, not desiring any, anything that the objective life can give. Yeah. So, it's a very interesting image again, another one. The... <clears throat> The Gita is full of beautiful images, just like Savitri is absolute. Or the truths, always the higher truths are given through images, because words are not adequate enough. Very small para, we'll read quickly. Therefore, the <coughs> upward and inward orientation of the intelligent will that we must resolutely choose with a settled concentration and perseverance. Vyavasaya. Vyavasaya is <coughs> effort. Okay, a, 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 an intensity of uh, effort, Vyavasaya, and with concentration and perseverance. Just two minutes of effort won't do. You have to con consciously, you go on failing, but you must go on doggedly, continue and practice. But this is true of everything in the physical world. Na? Those who are athletes, they go on practicing. Those who are cricketers, go on practicing. Those who are musicians, go on. Okay, they Riyas, they have to go on doing uh, practice in practice and it becomes absolutely perfect. So in yoga, it's the same. You have to go on practicing, practicing, practicing. <coughs> there is a very interesting incident with Ramakrishna's life where the Totapuri, who was a Brahman knower, he used to move out only with wooden sandals and a, a kamandalu, where he used to keep water and he used to drink that water. And every day, he, he came and taught... Um, Ramakrishna, the impersonal aspect of the divine, not the personal aspect, because Ramakrishna always had the personal aspect. He was always talking to his mother and getting directions from her and all, but he had not got the knowledge aspect of the impersonal Brahman. So he had come and taught him. And that's a very interesting story, which went on for six months. Okay, He was going out of his body and remaining there for long periods. And uh, <coughs> Totapuri was helping him is push food into his uh, mouth and keep him alive. <laughs> then he used to clean his kamandalu every day with that jug of water. Okay, And Ramakrishna asked him that you are a Brahman knower. Why the hell are you going on cleaning that uh, <laughs> kamandalu every day? <laughs> okay. No, sorry. Uh, he used to meditate. I'm sorry. I'm making a mistake. He used to meditate every day. So then he asked him, then why are you meditating every day? Because you are already a Brahman knower. He said, no, no, it's not like that. It is like the Kamandalu, which has to be cleaned every day. It gets dirty and you have to clean it every day. So your mind also is attracted towards the outer world and you have to clean it every day. That's why I have to meditate. But of course, he didn't say that a time comes when you don't have to meditate anymore because you are permanently fixed in that consciousness. So, that is the story. <clears throat> so, it must fix it firmly in the calm self-knowledge of the Purusha. The first movement must be obviously to get rid of desire. Desire, ego, attachment, these are the three things which tie you down to the physical world. So, you have to get rid of desire. Which is the whole root of the evil and suffering. And in order to get rid of desire, we must put an end to the cause of desire. And what is that? The rushing out of the senses to seize and enjoy their objects. We must draw them back when they are inclined thus to rush out, drawing them away from their objects. As the tortoise draws in its limbs into the shell, so these into their source quiescent in the mind, and the mind quiescent in intelligence. The intelligence quiescent in the soul and its self-knowledge. Observing the action of nature, but not subject to it. Not desiring anything that the objective life can give us. The objective life 
the physical life outside us. So, beautiful image. Like, by the way, the word Toto is, I'm pronouncing it like an Indian way, but it's often, um, there are different pronunciations. Tortoise, also they say, okay. So, whatever it is, we know what he's talking about. Uh, it's a uh, Kurmanganiva. That is the uh, phrase in the Kurma, the um, tortoise, which to protect itself, it pulls in its limbs. The two legs, the four legs, they had only legs in him, and the neck also, the head, it pushed it inside and it protects itself in that way. That's exactly what you have also to do. The senses had to be pulled in. And in the uh, Patanjali's uh, Raj Yoga, it's described as a Pratyahara, Prati Ahara. You don't have to feed the vital. You have to restrict it. Don't feed the vital. Okay. Just as you feed the body, you also feed the vital with your senses. The senses actually keep the vital alive. <coughs> and thoughts keep the mind alive. So all these have to be controlled. <coughs> That's what he's saying. Rangada, yeah, Rangada, tell me. Yeah, tell me. The, is, control and suppression are two different things. No? Absolutely, absolutely. But in the beginning... Uh, it, has, it has to come with suppression. Yes, that's right. <laughs> because if you don't do that, then naturally you will... Then later on, that suppression becomes slowly the real control. control. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Quite right. <laughs> but there are many people who continue with the only the suppression. That is to say, those who are very... That's why virtuous. Those who are very virtuous, you know. Oh, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do this. I don't do that. <laughs> Not much of value in the spiritual world. <laughs> you may do all those things and yet not be attached. And that is the real control. <laughs> That's right. I told you the story of uh, uh, Kameshwar, na? Kameshwar ji, he used to look after the servants. And uh, one day he was invited to a Frenchman's house. Okay, And he came back and told mother, Mother, you know, that Frenchman offered me wine. And I refused. Hoping that mother would praise him. <laughs> and, mother, and mother told him, okay, <laughs> what? You refuse a Frenchman what he offered to you? <laughs> you should not have acted, you should not have denied. <laughs> Remain unattached. You don't need to be attached to anything. But if you're not attached, then it doesn't matter what you do in the physical world. <laughs> so, there is, of course, a, a limit to that also, but that's exactly it. Today, I was watching a video of a, I don't know if you people know, but there is this boy, uh, his name is Dhirendra Shastri. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a 26 yes. year old boy, okay? And um, I won't go into details because some things, but he's forecasting things for people, giving blessings and all that, and they ask him, Today's video, they asked him, usually those who are holy men, they don't like tea and coffee. But I heard that you take tea. So he said, yes, I do take tea. And because my guru used to give me, he used to love tea with adrak. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Like the Gujarati tea, they put masala no, inside. So he says that he used to take and half the cup, he used to give it to me. So when I am drinking tea, it reminds me, it reminds me of my guru. And the guru reminds me of God. So what's wrong with that? <laughs> so all these ideas of don't do this, don't do that, all moral ideas, they are valid at the lower level, but they are not valid at the higher spiritual level. They, morality is not spirituality. <clears throat> That's the difference between suppression and um, control, real control. So, as the tortoise draws in its limbs into the shell, so these into their souls, quiescent in the mind, the mind quiescent in intelligence, the intelligence quiescent in the soul and its self-knowledge, observing the action of nature, <clears throat> not rejecting, you're just watching carefully without being affected. Okay? Again, we come back to that beautiful image of the uh, Gita, all the rivers and all the waters are flowing into the sea, but the sea remains absolutely undisturbed <clears throat> because it is infinite. So exactly the same way, 
sights and smells and sounds and touches and tastes coming from outside leave you absolutely undisturbed. You allow them to come in, but they leave you absolutely undisturbed. So that's the observing the acts of nature, but not subject to it, not desiring anything that the objective life can give us. Interesting, you are not desiring, but you are not forbidden to enjoy. So enjoyment is different from attachment. In our case, normally when we enjoy, it gives birth to attachment. I taste a very good mango and I get a desire for more mangoes. <laughs> okay. But this, the yogi, he enjoys it, but there is no desire born out of that because he is not affected by it. Enjoyment is okay, fine, but not attachment. We have got time. We can read, I think, one more para. <laughs> it is not an external asceticism. That's exactly what we were discussing. So, if Tarika is there, she can read. I don't know if she's there. I don't think she's there. Pallavi, maybe you can read. No, no I'm, I'm there, but I don't. I'm there, but I don't have the book. Okay, okay. You don't have to. Okay, then. Pallavi can read. <laughs> okay. Okay, Rangan. Yeah, go ahead. It is, it, not. Is not an it is not an external asceticism, the physical renunciation of the objects of sense that I am teaching, suggests Krishna immediately to avoid a misunderstanding which is likely at once to arise. Not the renunciation of the sankhyas or the austerities of the rigid ascetic with his fasts, his macerations of the body, his attempt to abstain even from food. That is not the self-discipline or the abstinence which I mean. For I speak of an inner withdrawal, a renunciation of desire. The embodied soul, having a body, has to support it normally by food for its normal physical action. By abstention from food, it simply removes from itself the physical contact with the object of sense, but does not get rid of the inner relation which makes that contact hurtful. It retains the pleasure of the sense in the object, the rasa, the liking and disliking, for rasa has two sides. The soul must, on the contrary, be capable of enduring the physical contact without suffering inwardly this sensuous reaction. Otherwise, there is nivritti, sensation of object, visaya vinivartanate, but no subjective cessation, no nivritti of mind, but the senses are the are of the mind, subjective and subjective cessation of the rasa is the only real sign of mastery. But how is this desireless contact with objects, this unsensuous use of the senses possible? It is possible. Param dristva, by the vision of the supreme, Param, the soul, the purusha, and by living in the yoga, in union or oneness of the whole subjective being with that, through the yoga of the intelligence, for the one soul is calm, satisfied in its own delight. And that delight, free from duality, can take once we see the supreme thing in us and fix the mind and will on that, the place of sensuous object ridden pleasures and repulsions of the mind. This is the true way of liberation. Yeah. So, interesting, but again, he's, that's exactly what we were discussing, subtraction and, um, and uh, real control. It is not an external asceticism. That's a suppression. Real, I... I love rasagulla, but I won't eat. Okay, but that's of no use. Rather, what you should do is to cut in the mind the attachment to the rasagullas. Then, whether you eat or not, it doesn't matter because you are not affected by it. It is not an external asceticism. The physical renunciation of objects of sense that I am teaching suggests Krishna immediately to avoid a misunderstanding which is likely at once to arise. That is very interesting. Sri also mm -hmm. says the same thing. He says it's not necessary to 
give up the physical world and the physical even your clothes now that does that mean that he uh, disapproves of uh, renunciating renunciating the world renouncing the world no shamda does not um, disapprove but you can do it if you want but it's not absolutely essential look at ramana maharshi he absolutely <clears throat> gave up all his even clothes he threw away his money everything no food nothing when he was hungry he used to go out and beg in the streets now what about the um, the uh, digambar jains okay they don't even wear clothes <laughs> so it is if it is done in the right way that's fine because then you are both are there there's an external uh, renunciation and there's an internal renunciation but the external renunciation is not absolutely essential that's what should be saying but if you want to do that sometimes and shrimdu say something very interesting because when he came to pondicherry he came in a hurry no clothes nothing no money no clothes okay they came here and he had to borrow money from the uh, sufficiently well to do people and well disposed towards him and sometimes there is no food even so he says that even if you <coughs> you if you have to test your non attachment sometimes you are made to go through the austerity measures so one day there was no food even there was only rice they didn't have any money for even buying vegetables or anything else so chemdu points out that sometimes it is necessary to do the external renunciation also because then you come to know for sure that yes there is no attachment left but if you go on indulging in the external thing without giving up how can you be 100% sure that you have no attachment so to test that attachment or not if you have attachment or not give up the thing and see whether there is any effect in you that's exactly what shrindo says and that they have to go through that period Okay, he didn't have even clothes. He is asking Motilal Roy to send clothes, even shoes. <laughs> and a very interesting incident, na? Where he asks, he says, even shoes you have to send. I don't even have shoes because the only pair I had has been taken away by Subramanya Bharati. <laughs> so that was their condition when he came to Pondicherry. <clears throat> okay, so sometimes you have to. So with this background, we'll read the. it is not an external asceticism the physical renunciation of the objects of sense and i am teaching suggests krishna immediately to avoid a misunderstanding which is likely at once to arise in other words <coughs> renounce sanyasa give up the physical world and go away to the cave and the forest no shri krishna is not suggesting that not the renunciation of the sankhyas or the austerities of the rigid ascetic which is fast is maceration of the body maceration mortification you know sometimes they uh, food deny food to themselves deny clothes to themselves in uh, cold weather and they even lie on a bed of nails no comfort at all so this is all this is not necessary you may do it to test yourself but it's not necessary and certainly not the mortification and the hurting of oneself even in uh, in christianity also the franciscan nuns or the franciscan monks they don't keep any food for tomorrow if it doesn't come it's all right divine is telling us testing us they don't keep back any food for tomorrow that the franciscan monks are like that they wear sackcloth they wear rough clothing <coughs> to get rid of attachment but that does not necessarily give you the non attachment So you, it is more important to do it psychologically. So maceration of the body certainly, the Gita also does not approve, and neither does Sri Ramdas. On the contrary, if you have a problem with your body, get it cured. Take care of your body. It's an instrumentation given to you by God. Not punish it and not um, torture it like many do. There is a Christian tradition also where they do that, and the Muslims also when they are doing there are some festivals they go on. Uh, whipping themselves in the back until blood comes out okay. so these are not things that need to be done in india fasting is uh, very common okay but uh, so even if you fast 
there are many people who fast for one day. If it is done as a measure for health purposes, it may not be bad. But Sirudu says if it is done for spiritual purposes, there is no value. Because you fast and the next day you eat double the quantity. <laughs> <laughs> so he says that is no man. Just like Mauna, absolute silence also is of no use. Ultimately, the real control is you have to say what is necessary and you have to keep quiet when it is necessary. That is real Mauna. <laughs> so there is a middle path for everything. So, certainly, the torturing of the body is not approved by the Gita. Okay. So, uh, or the abstinence, which I mean, for I speak of an inner withdrawal, a renunciation of desire. Okay? There are two words, sannyasa and the other word is uh, tyaga. The, he makes, the Gita makes a distinction between these two. Sannyasa is a putting down and not doing and tyaga is a giving up in the mind. Okay? That is the important part. The embodied soul having a body has to support it normally by food for its normal physical action. By abstention from food, it simply removes of itself the physical contact with the object of sense, but does not get rid of the inner relation which makes the contact hurtful. It retains the pleasure of the sense in the object, the rasa, the liking and the disliking. For rasa has two sides. The soul must on the contrary, be capable of enduring the physical contact without suffering inwardly this sensuous reaction. Otherwise, there is nivritti, cessation. No nivritti of the mind, but only nivritti of the outward action. Nivritti is a cessation, the stopping. But <clears throat> so uh, there is nivritti, cessation of the object, vishaya nivartante. Vishaya is the uh, Sanskrit word for sense object. object. Yeah, sense object. Vishaya. Okay. When you but, in... Yeah, but no subject is session nibritti. But the senses are of the mind. Subjective and subjective cessation of the rasa is the only sign of mastery. But how is this to be achieved? I'll hurry up because it's, the time is over. So how to achieve this uh, total samatha? Param drishtva. Once you have a glimpse of the supreme reality or God or the, <coughs> the silent self, if you have a glimpse of that, then you get the real condition and then it becomes very easy to get rid of it. That's what he's saying. It is possible. But how is this desireless contact with objects, this unsensuous use of the senses possible? It is possible. Param drishtva. By the vision of the Supreme, Param, the soul, the Purusha, and by living in the yoga, a union or oneness of the whole subjective being with that. Entirely subjective being, your inward being, as we identified with the <coughs> self. Through the yoga of the intelligence, for the soul, for the one soul is calm, satisfied in its own delight. And that delight, free from duality, can take once we see the supreme thing in us and fix the mind and will on that, the place of the sensuous, object-ridden pleasures and the repulsions of the mind. This is the true way of liberation. So, the liberation really is the cutting of the link of desire and attachment in the mind and vital, not the physical giving up of objects. It's not that you don't need to do that. You can do that if you want, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is the cutting of the control in the mind. <clears throat> okay? So, next time we'll take up the certainly self-discipline control is never easy. Okay. So, the Gita's is absolutely fantastic, uh, really most interesting. And I would recommend everyone to read the <laughs> Gita in English even, 
it doesn't matter english also and so even those english is absolutely marvelous so it should be very nice if you can do it okay bye bye everybody have a nice day thank you rakata merci one